Namaste. You know, it's really funny. We've been talking about this Shiva Sahasranama for like, I don't know, a month now, going through the introduction and the history and the origins and everything like that. And there was a good number of views. The interest was high. But now that we get to the actual thousand names, the number of views drops off a cliff. And it's like one half or one quarter even of the number of views of a typical video. Now, see, this is the thing. When we go from theory to actual practice, the interest drops. Why is that? People don't have a routine practice. Like, I get up early in the morning before sunrise from 3 to 5 o'clock in the morning, and I spend the first hour or so of my day just chanting japa of the Panchakshara Mantra, Aung Namah Shivaya. And this is so blissful, and it's so, how can I say it, gives me such a solid foundation of consciousness to go on through the day and to remain in Shiva consciousness, in Shiva yoga, to remain connected with Shiva and feel supported by Shiva and feel, you know, that I'm, I'm doing some valuable service. I can feel his interest because why? I'm calling him by his names. And he responds. He's not dull or insensitive. He's quite responsive and immediately available to those who are willing to set aside the ego. See, the thing that Shiva doesn't like is pride. When he sees that we're willing to uh, drop our pride in our false existence and approach him and realize our actual existence, he's very pleased. And he reciprocates with that. Like I said, if you take one step toward him, he takes 10 or 100 or 1,000 steps toward you because we are at the bottom of a well. huh? Try to understand this material world this Jagrat consciousness, this is the bottom. This is not the top, for, you know, like the, <laughs> like the scientists and philosophers arrogantly think that this Western egoistic individualism is like the highest development of mind in the universe. This is bullshit. It's totally wrong. It's completely opposite the actual truth. The actual truth is that we're here in this variegated material existence because we're fallen. We have fallen from the actual standard of spiritual life. And that's why we're here, to be corrected. And so there's suffering. You know, just like in any prison, uh, prison is not supposed to be fun, right? So if you going through a field and you accidentally fall in an old well, well, you're stuck, you're, you're finished, unless somebody comes along who can help you out. So hell, in this case, is Shiva's thousand names. And if you take them, this is like a rope, you know, that you can climb up out of the well. And... If you don't take it, if you don't study these names, learn the meanings, and chant them regularly, like I chant every morning before I do this uh, podcast, before I do these videos, I chant the names that we have covered so far and plus the names that we're going to cover in the present episode. Why? Just to 
to get my head back into where we are. In our study of this very important prayer. In fact, it's the most important, the most auspicious prayer. Nobody else says that. You don't hear that kind of a description even for the Vishnu Sahasranam. So, what to speak of other prayers? You know, there are many nice prayers in the scripture. Shiva Purana is full of them. Any of the Puranas are. But they never say that this is the most auspicious prayer. Only the Shiva Sahasranam is the most auspicious of all auspicious things. We went over that back in the introduction. So try to remain regular. Try to establish a regular practice. Try to at least chant the five-syllable mantra, Om Namah Shivaya, for a regulated number of times every day. Use a mala, 108 beads. That's the standard way of doing it. And stabilize your spiritual life so that you can work toward the final state of enlightenment. Shiva will reciprocate. Mark my words. <laughs> so here are the four verses we're going to study today. Dhyana dharo paritche dyo gauri bharta ganeshwaraha Ashtamurtir Vishvamurti Srivarga Svarga Sadanaha Jnana Gamyo Dridha Pragyo Deva Deva Strilochanaha Vama Devo Mahadeva Patu Parivridho Dridaha Vishvarupo Virupaksho Vagisha Shuchi Sattamaha Sarva Pramana Sangvadi Vrishanko Vrishavahanaha Isha Pinaki Katvangi Chitravesha Shirantanaha Tamoharo Mahayogi Gopta Brahma Chadurjatihi Tiana Dharo Parichedyo Gauri Bharta Ganeshwaraha Ashtamurtir Vishvamurti Srivarga Svarga Sadanaha Jnana Gamyo Dridha Pragyo Deva Deva Strilochanaha Vama Devo Mahadeva Patu Parivridho Dridaha Vishvarupo Virupaksho Vagisha Shuchi Sattamaha Sarva Pramana Sangvadi Vrishanko Vrishavahanaha Isha Pinaki Katvangi Chitravesha Shirantanaha Tamoharo Mahayogi Gopta Brahma Chadurjatihi Tiana Dharo Parichedyo Gauri Bharta Ganeshwaraha Ashtamurtir Vishvamurti Srivarga Svarga Sadanaha Jnana Gamyo Dridha Pragyo Deva Deva Strilochanaha Vama Devo Mahadeva Patu Parivridho Dridaha Vishvarupo Virupaksho Vagisha Shuchi Sattamaha Sarva Pramana Sangvadi Vrishanko Vrishavahanaha Isha Pinaki Katvangi Chitravesha Shirantanaha Tamoharo Mahayogi Gopta Brahma Chadurjatihi So these names are very wonderful. And by chanting them, we get to realize Shiva's actual nature. First one is Dhyana Adharo. Dhyana Adhar means the object of meditation. Anytime we meditate in any way, Shiva is the object because Shiva is behind whatever 
other object we might be meditating on. Say, for example, another deity, or a mantra, or a sound, or any phenomenon. So, he is the ultimate object of meditation. Aparichedya. He's inexplicable. Parichedya means to explain. So, aparichedya means one who is beyond explanation. Like, <laughs> no one can explain, not even the scriptures, how Shiva, who has no attributes as Brahman, comes to have attributes as Sadashiva, as Rudra, as Shakti. See? How is this possible? And of course, it's through the process of illusion. But even how does that work? And we talked about vortex theory, where you have some energy and you spin it like a whirlpool and it acquires mass and so on, other properties. Huh? But even then, where does that energy come from? You know, there is always a polarity between, you know, the source of the energy and the receiver of the energy, like the anode and cathode of a, of a tube or a transistor. So to make current flow, so then you can disturb it and do stuff to it <laughs> and turn that energy into mass. You have to have a medium. You have to have a way of making things flow. So who knows how he does it, you know? Maybe he doesn't even know. <laughs> In any case, it's very difficult for us to understand. Gauri Bratra means the husband of Gauri. Gauri is Shakti. She is the energy, and he is the energetic. So they are naturally mates, and they are each other's complement. Ganeshwara. Ganeshwara is the uh, master of the ganas. The ganas are the associates. So we become a Shiva gana by performance of this mantra and meditation on Shiva. Ashtamurti, having eight cosmic bodies. Oh, I could do a whole video series just on this name. Now, these names are deep. Each one of them has tremendous, profound meaning. Vishvamurti. He's not only Ashtamurti, he's also Vishvamurti. He is the form of everything. And his forms are vast. They're grand. They're all-encompassing. Vishva. So then, Trivarga means he's the bestower of the three desirable things, Dharma, Artha, and Kama. He's also the bestower of Moksha. But that's the fourth Varga. Svarga Sadhana. His worship leads to attainment of the heavenly planets, not only the heavenly planets, Shiva Loka, which is beyond the heavenly planets. And we're going to go over the nature of Shiva Loka in an upcoming video called Dream Time. Watch for it. Jnanagamya means he's attainable by transcendental realization, perfect knowledge, perfect consciousness. See, like we talk about the four states of consciousness all the time. This is the basis of jnana. So you should study these things and use them to understand your life and the world and God. Dhritta of steady intellect. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't have to. He already has perfect knowledge of everything. So his mind is very steady. He doesn't change. Once he makes a decision... That's it. It's permanent. Deva Deva. He's the Lord of gods. We've been over this before. The God of the gods. Three Lochana. Three eyed. He has this third eye in his forehead. Look out when that opens. <laughs> Vama Deva. He's beautiful. Vamana. 
he's very, very uh, cute and attractive to everyone. And, oh, I should mention that when you meet Shiva, he will adopt a form that is just perfectly attractive to your particular taste. That's his nature. Because the next name, Mahadev, he is the great Lord. He can do anything and everything. He can appear differently to everyone, even in the same room. <laughs> we'll go into that in this other series. Patu, he's efficient. Efficient means he doesn't waste anything. He gets stuff done with a minimum of resources. Well, actually, he is the bottomless source of all resources. Parivrita, chief, more really the, the highest officer, the highest leader of everyone, of all. And Dritta, firm. He is very firm. When he makes up his mind to do something, that's the end of it. <laughs> Vishwarupa. Vishwarupa means everything is his form. His forms are everywhere. As the moon, the sun, the sky, as the intellect, as light, as darkness, as the self. He's everywhere. Viru Paksha. Viru Paksha means he has an odd number of eyes. And of course, Viru Paksha was the name of the cave where Ramana Maharshi did his important uh, sadhana to establish himself as a fully self realized master. Vagisha, Lord of Speech. Vak is speech. And Isha means Lord. That means whatever he says is truth. And whatever he says happens. Whatever he says goes. <laughs> so one should speak the truth. And this develops a, a power, a siddhi, called vak siddhi. It means the power of speech, that whatever you say is truth and comes true. Shuchi. He's pure. He's clean. Uh, in fact, he is so pure, he purifies everything. Even this nasty material world at the end of the creation, he burns it to ashes. Huh? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. This world is made out of the ashes of the previous one. And in the same way, this world will also be burnt to ashes at the end. Sattama, the most excellent God. This is Sat Uttama. Sattama, the most excellent, the most truthful, most pure, most perfect, everything. Sarva Pramana Sanvadi, in whom all authorities and proofs agree. Now, of course, some motivated, sectarian, selfish people will disagree and say, no, Shiva isn't God, Vishnu is God, or Jehovah is God, or Allah is God. But these are just different names for Shiva. They don't understand. They think because the name is different that the God is different. But no, there's only room for one, God. <laughs> And he adopts different names and forms to appeal to different classes of people. Brishanka means his banner, his flag, is the symbol of a bull. And Brishavahana means his vehicle is a bull, Nandi. He rides Nandi everywhere. Isha. Isha means the first. He's the first being before all others. So he's naturally the Lord. Pinakin, he's holding a bow. Huh? He's an expert archer. He can do anything with his arrows, including destroy the world. Um, 
Katvangi. Katvangi means holding arrows, missiles. The Vedic arrows aren't just ordinary arrows, you know, like we have in archery today, but they could be imbued with mantras and have tremendous power. Chitravesha means a variegated dress. Sometimes he wears nothing at all. <laughs> Sometimes he wears animal skins. Sometimes he wears cloth. Sometimes he wears white. Sometimes he wears black. <laughs> you never know how Shiva is going to appear. Chirantana. He is existing from ancient times. Well, he's Isha, the first person. So he's the most ancient. He's the oldest. He's the most senior. And everyone else is descended from him. Tamoharu. Before we discussed Hara, which means the seizer or remover or taker or destroyer. And now, Tamohara. Tamo is ignorance. So he removes ignorance by giving transcendental knowledge through his names. Mahayogi, the great yogi, the greatest yogi. Goptri, protector. If you take shelter of Shiva's holy names, he will protect you. I'm experienced. I know. I have uh, direct personal experience of this. Brahma, he's identical with Brahma. In other words, he expands as Brahma, Vishnu, and Rudra for the purposes of the creation, maintenance, and dissolution of the material universe and the modes of nature, passion, goodness, and ignorance. And finally, Jurdatin, having a burden of dreadlocks. Huh? His dreadlocks are so huge. <laughs> it's like a burden that he carries on his head. And sometimes you'll see him with his dreads like uh, in a bun on the top of his head. And they're heavy. <laughs> they're long. So this is Shiva. And we should worship and contemplate on his names every single day. This is such an important part of sadhana. And we do it anyway. Anytime we read the scripture, anytime we study any of the prayers or any of the commentaries by any of the great yogis, we encounter his holy names just in the course of reading any kind of Sanskrit material because these are, in many cases, common Sanskrit words. So this is called nama bhas. If a word is used to describe something else, but originally it's a name of God, a name of Shiva or Vishnu, these have potency, whether they are in the context that means or indicates the name belongs to Shiva or not. Actually, the world is sustained by this nama bhas because people use words all the time, even in other languages, that are actually originally words that refer to Shiva or Vishnu. And this is what protects the world, even though people are in ignorance of the actual meaning. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum. Om Namah Shivaya.